Welcome to the Weekly Dose Podcast, your one-stop shop for the weekly news in incretin mimetic therapies with your host, Man on the Majaro, Dave Knapp. Welcome to the Tuesday, June 4th, 2024 edition of On the Pin, the Weekly Dose Podcast. My name is Dave Knapp. I'm the Man on the Manjaro. That's why I'm here. You are on the pin. That's why you're here, and we're all here to learn a little bit more this week. Of course, the Weekly Dose Podcast is your one-stop shop for incretin mimetic news, all the news in the world of type 2 diabetes and obesity, and there's a ton of news to get into, so we're going to jump right into it this week. First thing we're going to talk about is the big elephant in the room, and that's the fact that Novo Nordisk has resumed a national advertising campaign for Wigovi. Just uh, sort of a fascinating move by Novo Nordisk, the the campaign called The Power of Wigovi. And interestingly, you know, from the patient perspective, which is oftentimes the perspective that we talk about here because that's you and I, is that it seems like the advertising of medications that are in a declared FDA shortage shouldn't even be allowed. Uh, As you all know, we talk about this very routinely on this channel, whether we're talking about uh, the GLP-1s from Novo Nordisk, or we're talking about the GLP-1 medications from Eli Lilly. People are really struggling, going up and down in dosages, having to drive two, 300 miles to find their medicine, uh, switching medications because they can't find their medicine. And it's just a, a fascinating thing in the United States that a company is able to advertise a drug that they have people on that they can't serve. And so that is a super, super frustrating thing, but some interesting factoids. Hat tip Clark Kent, as always, for uh, a ton of the news that we cover on this podcast. The spend for 2023, the number five advertising spend for a drug was Rebelsis at $191 million. That's the pill form of semaglutide, $191 million. The number six advertising spend was Ozempic at $187.4 million, which is a 6% increase from 2022. And of course, you see um, just a huge push from Novo Nordisk to advertise Rebelsis, which is obviously the pill form, might be an indication that that is a much easier drug to manufacture, though it requires a ton more API. Uh, So Novo Nordisk resuming their advertising on a national level, level, the power of Wagovi. Let me know in the comments of the video what your thoughts are on that. Some interesting news from Structure Therapeutics. You saw a big jump in their stock this week. So they have a small molecule GLP-1 pill similar to Orforglipron from Eli Lilly. And we got some information on GSBR-1290. And so what we saw here was in a 12-week phase two clinical trial, the tablet, tab, tablet, excuse me, tablet formulation of GSBR-1290 had a weight loss of 6.9% which was huge. Uh, This was a 12-week study, and those numbers are right up there with Orforglipron. So really, really good news. Obviously, these are in a early stage clinical trial, but I think it's reason uh, to get excited anytime we hear about another pharmaceutical company getting into the incretin mimetic space, because there's just no way that Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly will be able to serve the market over time. And so I think that that's exciting news. Obviously, investors thought the same thing. Uh, you, th- you think about the development of the next generation combination GLP ones, they're looking at combining GLP ones with GIP, amylin, glucagon, uh, and, and other oral small molecules. So you're seeing the, uh, the potential for combining um, mechanisms of action. Uh, on in within a pill, which is really an exciting thing. Check out Madison Muller's article over in Bloomberg uh, for some more information on that and just excellent, excellent news. There is some super fascinating news. Some of the most fascinating news that I have read in my entire time covering these medications and covering diabetes and obesity treatments. Some interesting news dropped at the end of April from Shanghai, China. Now, listen to this. So there was a a patient who had two diabetes for 25 years. Uh, This patient was at serious risk for complications, already had a kidney transplant in 2017. 
Uh, he almost lost his pancreas islet function altogether, and that's obviously something that helps control uh, blood glucose levels. And this guy relied on multiple insulin injections daily. And basically what they did with this patient in Shanghai was they took stem cells and transplanted them into his pancreas. And what happened was a complete reversal of his type 2 diabetes to this day. Uh, this gentleman is off of insulin and his type 2 diabetes has been reversed. So when you think of the potential that this treatment could have for patients with type 2 diabetes using stem cell therapy, this could be an absolute game changer for those who, who lament the fact that they have to take uh, daily or weekly injections. This shows absolutely huge promise out of China. Not hearing a whole lot about this bit of news in the United States, but this could be an absolute game changer. You have drug companies in the United States scrambling with the GLP-1 medications to sort of increase uh, the amount of time between therapies. So you see with Amgen 133 Maritide, you see they're pushing to basically have a monthly injection and maybe try to make that even a little bit longer uh, spaced out with their monoclonal antibody GLP-1 and GIP antagonist medication. And so the thought of having sort of a one and done procedure where they take stem cells from your own body, transplant them in your pancreas and reverse type 2 diabetes could be an absolute game changer. So they're looking at expanding this obviously into other clinical trials. They're watching this gentleman uh, very closely. But this is just fascinating news in the world of GLP-1, or excuse me, in the world of type 2 diabetes for those of us who maybe don't like the idea of being on a GLP-1 for the rest of our lives. Interesting news this week from Elon Musk, who basically uh, had a fascinating tweet about the topic of Ozempic and Manjaro. Um, basically, somebody was kind of going off on, uh, it seems this, there's this false dichotomy that we either have to fix the food supply in our country or, or we all have to be medicated. And I think uh, neither is universally true. I don't think that everybody has to be medicated and, and I don't think that we can completely fix the food environment in this country. There are things that we can do, obviously, uh, but uh, Elon Musk kind of weighing in on this as somebody who's uh, also uh, mentioned in the past that he was a user of Ozempic, thinks that we should make more Ozempic and Manjaro and sees a future where more and more people will be on these treatments and these treatments will be inexpensive kind of mentioning the fact that these are not inherently expensive drugs to manufacture. So there, there is a huge future. So it'll be interesting to see if he, he puts his hat in the ring in some of the development of these medications, perhaps uh, developing maybe even a cheaper, more accessible version would be a fascinating thing to follow. Of course, you have the medical side uh, in Neuralink, right? That's running clinical trials for Neuralink. And they're even looking at Neuralink for, treating obesity and potentially helping to, to curtail behaviors that exacerbate the issues with obesity. So fascinating to hear him weigh in on that. That tweet has currently been seen uh, nearly half a million times. So just a more, more Ozempic in the national conversation. I think this is a good thing. Really interesting news last week out of the Endo 2024 conference. So the Endocrine Society Medical Conference happens every year and we typically learn new things. Every time uh, a pharmaceutical company can kind of get up there and, and flex about some of the latest and greatest from their clinical trials. So one of the things that we learned, and I covered this on some short form videos this week, is that what they've learned with semaglutide in a small study of about 30 women, uh, 30 female participants with an average age of about 34 years old. And what they did was they basically put these women under an MRI, half of them on semaglutide, half of them on placebo, and they put them under an MRI and allowed them to taste something sweet. And they watched the way that the brain responded. And what they saw was a significant increase in the brain response of the participants who were on semaglutide. Interestingly enough, they uh, were able to sort of cross compare that data with the fact that most people who are obese have a, a lower reaction in their brain to sugar and sweet tastes, but they are more drawn to it. So the idea is that increasing the brain activity when taking in uh, sugar will allow a 
more rapid satiated response and a lower consumption overall of sugar. They also noted that in this trial, the taste buds of those who are on semaglutide actually regenerated and completely changed. So you saw not only an increased brain response, but you saw physiologically that just was a less of a desire because of the change, physical change in the taste buds of the participants. So really, really fascinating information. Of course, we'll see more and more information about that drop as they continue to study this. This is just a fascinating thing. The second thing that we learned about terzepatide, the other was about semaglutide, about terzepatide, we learned that women have a much higher response from a weight loss perspective with terzepatide than males do. So basically they took all the surmount trial data and aggregated it. And from the weight loss perspective, women tended to lose up to 24.6% 20, uh, of their body weight. So nearly 25% of their body weight on average, where male participants tended to lose about 18% of their body weight. So a huge response from women and compared to men. Now, these clinical trials for GLP-1s have historically been weighted uh, more on the female side. So there's typically more female participants in these trials to begin with. And I think that you see that sort of play out in the real world too. You see many, many, many more women on GLP-1 treatments than you do men. I think that we'll see that change over time. But fascinatingly, you see with the reditrutide trials, Eli Lilly has sort of tried to even that out, even that out in that trial. But still, the data remains the same, that women with reditrutide tend to respond much, uh, much more efficiently to the treatment from a weight loss perspective. So that's fascinating to, uh, to kind of keep your eye on as well as they continue to, de to develop these new medications. Uh, of course, I will cover all of that as it comes out here at On The Pen the weekly dose. This past week, to kind of wrap this up this week, if you missed On The Pen Live, we had CEO and co-founder of Roe, the online telehealth juggernaut, on On The Pen Live. And he was on the show to share about a amazing new tool that they have released to the public. Now, this is, this is sort of like an open source crowdsourcing information to track GLP-1 shortages in real time. In other words, to create alerts for people who are on medication to know what pharmacies in what areas are getting the medication. So essentially what happens here is you have a user that will go in uh, to their, their tracker tool, which you can find in the description of the video. You go to the tracker tool, you basically select the medication you're on, you put in your location and you, you let the uh, app know whether you are able to pick up your medication or whether you were not able to pick up your medication and where that was. And essentially what that's going to do is if you're able to find the medication, it's going to send an email alert to anybody else who's shared information. And it's going to say, hey, within 100 miles of your home or 50 miles of your home, people are finding medication. Now people are like, well, there's not always going to be stock at a pharmacy, if you go pick up your 15 milligram, you're probably taking the only 15 milligram box they have, and that's fair. But I think what it does is it actually shows that the distributors in the area have the medication and the pharmacies are able to order it. So while it may not mean that you're going to go to the exact CVS on First Street, it, it is an indication that the wholesalers that are providing the pharmacies with your medication are able to get it in your area. So this is a really interesting tool. Again, it's crowdsourced. You don't have to be a member of Row to use it. Uh, you just have to be on a GLP-1 and willing to share your email address with them, and they will send you alerts as people pump information. So this is a crowdsourced uh, tool. And so the more that we use it as a community, the more it's going to be a, a valuable and effective tool for the community. So I would highly recommend that you jump over to row.co forward slash supply hyphen tracker. Again, the link will be in the description of this video. And check that out and just put in your information when you're able to find it. Uh, I think this could be a really, really fascinating tool. And we thank you, Zachariah Rotano, for coming on On The Pen. It was an absolutely great show, great conversation. If you missed it, we'll link that in the description of the show notes as well, so you can check that out. Let me know in the comments before we sign off here if you're enjoying this podcast and maybe what you'd like to see more of or less of. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being the best part of what we do at On The Pen, The Weekly Dose. 
Make sure if you enjoy the podcast to leave it a five-star rating and review because that is what helps others see this podcast. Until next week, we will see you on the pen. Have a great week. Thank you.